everyone, Dylan Schumacher, Citadel Defense, and welcome back. Welcome back to another episode of Night Rider. I really like that uh, intro song, by the way. That's uh, Blizzard by Kavinsky, in case you're wondering. If you're unfamiliar with this series here, this is where we do kind of a long-form content here, and I usually just talk about some subject of some, su some such or another. And uh, I might I might end up putting these on like Spotify or something to um, have kind of a pod podcasty feel. I don't know. Does the world need more podcasts? Anyway, <clears throat> uh, topic of today's thing, which which seems um, appropriate given events <laughs> around the world. Uh, I'm recording this on August fifth, so uh, markets are in deep trouble right now. Um, you know, a couple weeks ago, maybe two ish now, I can't remember. Uh, they tried to assassinate Trump. They switched to Kamala Harris on the Democrat side. Um, not, not tried to assassinate her, at least not that I know of. But, uh, what I've been thinking about is the, and I'm going to, I'm going to put this in heavy quotes here. Uh, the, the, the father of a nation or, or, or maybe like, the the longing for the strong man, right? Uh, if you're a, a big student of Nietzsche, you you might have some more interesting takes on this topic and the Ubermensch, and uh, and things. And or if you've read maybe Hobbes or something. But I was just thinking about the idea of governments and uh, and how we order society, right? So. I don't know how long I've been thinking about this, but it's probably been like five, six weeks now. And uh, I've seen on and off in my Twitter feed kind of this uh, idea that uh, we need to we need to return to monarchy. Just just a little here and there's like and, and the, the argument goes that, you know, in a republic, elected leaders don't care about you the way that a monarch does, because with a monarch, the argument goes the uh his glory and his value is in his people right because he's invested long term in his people he's there for life so you know what he does and how his people fares so so he fares right and so that's a that's a pretty big pretty big deal so there's more incentive the argument goes to take care of your con constituents your subjects to take care of your country and your society and to husband the treasury and so forth and so on and as I was thinking about that, um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of history, in case you don't don't know that, um, but a big fan of history. And the first thing I thought was, well, that all sounds nice and fine on paper, except that history is littered with monarchs who have done the exact opposite of that, who, because they had absolute power, uh, completely... Um, did not husband the treasury, did not care about their subjects, continued to live off the fat of the land while people starved, right? You look at monarchs with absolute power and they build beautiful palaces while their subjects are struggling, right? I mean, littered with them. Like you, you turn to any page in the book of Kings in the Bible, you're going to find a bad king. It's not hard. Um, Open any any history book on the history of monarchs in any country across humankind anywhere ever. Chances are they're a mediocre at best to a terrible king, right? Uh, kings started World War One, right? You look at uh, Wilhelm the Second, I think, uh, of Germany, who is not a king by the end of the war because Germany loses and their entire country is eradicated, at least in that current form. Uh, you look at uh, um, Austria, the, Aust the Habsburgs, right, who are ruling Austria, they don't survive. The Ottoman Empire doesn't survive. Not quite sure what the exact rule system was of the Ottoman Empire, to be honest. Uh, the Russian kings don't survive the war, right? And a lot of these with valid gripes, right? Meaning, uh, like the Russians are a good example, right? The communist revolution happens, which communism is deeply evil, the most evil system of government in humankind ever. But it takes root in Russia because there are legitimate gripes, concerns, frustrations, disenfranchisements, angers, whatever, among the people, right? Um, of the kings ignoring them and letting them live in abject poverty and squalor while they, of course, live just fine, right? So history is littered with these kings that don't do well. 
And so I, I was thinking about this and like, what is it exactly in the human heart that longs for the strong man, right? That longs for the person who's going to come in and they're going to fix it. They have all, they're going to take absolute power and they're going to fix it, right? The Romans had a system like this. It was called a dictator. And yes, that's where we get the word from. Um, and they had a system of government. So the Romans had a republic and they had a system of government where the dictator could come in and would have absolute power for like six months, a year, or something like that. I think it was six months. It was the typical um, term of the dictator. And they would appoint a master of horse who was basically the second in command and had absolute power and only had to answer to the dictator, right? And then the dictator would use this power to, to, to fix it, right? To cut through all the red tape, to get rid of the bureaucracy, to have absolute power to fix it. And this was a system in the Roman Republic, and they used it. They used it multiple times. Um, uh, Cincinnati, yeah, the, the person who's the city of Cincinnati is named after, Cincinnati, I think is how you pronounce it, I'm probably butchering that, did that, right? And he's very famous because they called George Washington the American Cincinnati, right? Because uh, Cincinnati came in, he took over, he fixed the problem, and then he gave it up. He gave up his dictatorial powers, his absolute control, sent it back to the Republic and the people, and then went back and like went to farming. You know, he's this ideal kind of Roman virtue person. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, he did that. He did it twice. Um, so this is, again, this idea that we would call up this moral, strong leader who's going to fix it for us. You see this in... Um, uh, the, the the lovings of Trump, right? And, and the hatred of Trump, actually, right? Uh, on the opposite, on people who don't like Trump, you see him call him a dictator. Oh, he's, he just wants to take absolute power and, and control it. And, you know, he's a monster and, you know, all this kind of thing. And the people who love him, right? He's a strong man. He can get it done. He can cut through the red tape. He can, he can really fix our problems in America. He can make America great again, right? And this, again, it's, it's this human longing for this strong man who's going to come in and fix it. And so I've been thinking about that for, like I said, five, six weeks, a while. Why do we want that? Right? And I think there are a couple different answers. Um, I mean, one, let's just be honest, to live under a good king is the best system of government. Hands down. You, you can't, I don't, I don't think you can beat it. To live under a good king and what do I mean when I say a good king? Well, someone who, again, is going to do all the things that we listed before that allegedly, supposedly, monarchy incentivizes you to do, right? So they're going to husband the treasury well. They're going to care for their subjects well. They're going to uh, consider themselves and the state and the people as kind of one united entity that they're going to, their job is to care for and manage and, and shepherd and protect, right? They're going to go out and fight the battles. They're going to... Um, you know, be, be the glory of the people, uh, if, if that, if that makes any sense. And, uh, a good King like that's hard to beat, you know, again, go on to the Bible here. You look at the King David, right? Good King, hard to beat, loves God, cares for his people. Well, fights all the enemies, right? Like good King, hard to beat. Um, people willingly and joyfully gave their lives for King David, right? You look at King Solomon for most of his reign, hard to beat, super wealthy, super wise, builds a lot of public works and uh, a temple to worship God in. And I mean, all this stuff, right? So good kings are very, very hard. You look at Richard the Lionheart, right? A lot of people may not like him, but his subjects liked him. He was ferocious on the battlefield, right? There, there was a lot of value to getting to live under Richard the Lionheart. And I don't know a ton about Richard the Lionheart, so I'm sure, I'm sure someone could come up with some reason we shouldn't be excited about him. And I guess I'd have to bow out in that conversation. If you're like, what is he drinking? This is a uh, sparkling water with a little bit of, a little bit of cranberry juice in my house. We call it, we call it spike water. It's what like my two year old called it or something. So we just roll with that anyway. Um, so this idea that we have this, this strong man, and what are they going to do, right? So one, living under a good king, I don't know if it's possible to beat because they're not uh, bound by the red tape, right? They are the law unto themselves, right? 
And so in, in an absolute monarchy, right? Most monarchies in, in history haven't been that. Like the king is subject to laws. The king is subject to restraints on his power. Um, rarely are you going to find a monarch with complete, utter, and total godlike control. Very rarely in history do you find that. You, usually there's still restraints about what the king can and can't do. Um, so... Again, this idea that this king can come in and can fix it. It, it. It's unbeatable to live under that system of government. And I think that's one of the reasons people long for that. You know, if we could just give Trump total power and he could just, you know, clean out the swamp and remove the deep state and, and you know, whatever, um, then, we, then we'd be okay, right? Again, this human heart that longs for the, the strong man to come in and fix it. Two, I think it... it we we are in a late republic, and so we've seen we see all the problems with the republic at this point, right? Now, I would argue the reason we're in a late stage republic is because we're not actually doing what our founding documents said we should be doing, and someone else could say, well, that's irrelevant. The document led us here regardless, not irregardless. Irregardless isn't a word. The document led us here regardless, so it doesn't matter, Dylan. If you were like, if your complaint is, oh, we're not doing it right. The point is, we had the document, now we're here. So that's the problem. I can understand that line of thinking. I, I think I'd still disagree with that. But point being that we're in this late stage republic where everybody is bilking the treasury for everything they can get out of it, right? We're in this place where we elect people to uh, get themselves rich and enrich their friends in other countries and spend our tax dollars and our military might and whatever to further enrich themselves and their friends that's basically what the u.s federal government exists for at this point it's certainly not to punish evil it's certainly not to protect its citizens they spend more money and time spying on their citizens and and trying to police them and control them than they ever do protecting them i mean it's not even it's not even close um we have entire branches of the government devoted to that Right, like the NSA and the FBI, and I mean, it, it's the the IRS. Um, it's it's obscene, right? So the government exists at this point only to further protect itself, like a like some kind of parasite, and uh, and doesn't certainly exist in any of the things that a government should exist for, right? And, and I think tangent on a tangent here. What, one of the the problems too is that. You have to realize that the problem you're trying to solve is what the Bible calls sin, right? When you say, oh, well, you know, if we could just have this kind of government, if we could, if we could just, you know, orchestrate it this way or work it out this way, the, the American system of government is probably the best system of government ever conceived by mankind ever. It was created by a bunch of smart men who sat in a room and drew it up on paper from nothing. It wasn't something that evolved slowly over time. It wasn't didn't have these other traditions that they had to hold on to because they just had the baggage, right? They had traditions that were worked in, but it was all well thought out and purposeful. And I, I would argue best system of government in human history ever to date. Um, still didn't work out so hot, right? Uh, again, probably a variety of reasons of that that we could argue, but one of them, and I would argue the core issue here is human sin. That's that's the core issue. Human failings, weakness, evil, uh, fallenness, wh whatever word you want to use, the Bible calls it sin. Uh, but that that's really what we're talking about here. That's the issue we're trying to solve, the human condition. And you cannot, I am sorry to report, solve the human condition with a better system of government. Can't be done. Uh, again, wish it could. Wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. But it can't. Uh, so, the question then becomes, you know, what's the system of government that therefore will restrain human fallenness, evil, wickedness, sin, depravity, you know, what, what will do that the best? And when the founding fathers sat down and worked that out, they thought, oh, well, it's, it's clearly uh, this system of government that we've, that we've evolved because then the, the different government branches will keep each other in check and the states will keep the feds in check and the feds will keep the states in check. You know, it all, they set it up so they would be pitted against each other to try to restrain that call the power. It hasn't worked out, unfortunately. The Romans had another similar system, right? 
where they had a republic and they only they elected two consuls, which were essentially like our president. They elected two of them every year, right? And you can only hold that position once every 10 years. And that was only drawn from like the 400, 600, depending on what era you're in, senators, right? So they had like this aristocracy that was elected by the people and then they selected a proconsul and then they kind of worked out things, but they were very suspicious of ambition and there were no political parties. So they were, it was kind of every man for himself and they were constantly working to kind of keep each other's ambition in check, right? And, uh, and I think that that's, that's, you know, again, that was their attempt to restrain that, that human propensity towards evil and, and commandedness and by commandedness, I mean like, you know, a dictatorship, right? And some people would say, well, listen, you know, if we could just go back to monarchy, that might be better than what we got now. And, and again, I can understand that argument. But at the end of the day, we, all of us, whether you consider yourself a thir through and through Republican, I don't mean that in the GOP sense. I mean that in the system of government sense, right? Uh, or, or a monarchist or whatever. You still have this desire for the strong man to come in and fix it, to come in and just cut through the red tape and, and fix all the problems and keep us better, right? So I think I think there's there's a reason for that. I mean, the ones we've talked about. But also, I think, in addition to that, let's talk about uh, kings fight your battles, right? They, historically, that, that's what kings did, right? They went out physically on the front line, pulled out their sword, and, like, crushed some skulls, right? Um, a lot of kings were very physically involved in actual fighting. The Romans, again... You're going to hear a lot about the Romans. I'm a big Roman history fan. Uh, consuls went out and fought battles. Right? We want someone to go out and fight our battles for us. We want to send David down into the valley to kill Goliath for us so that we can have an easy life. We all want to do that, right? Some of you are like, well, I want to be David. Good for you. We want you to be David too. Um, but that's what we want. We want we want a king that's going to go out and fight our battles. That's why we like. That's why people like Trump, right? They want him to go out there and fight his, their battles for him. That's what they think he's going to do, and that's why they're excited to vote for him. That's why they, he gets so much uh, excitement and whatever at his rallies, because again, he's he's the strong man. He's the man who's going to go. Out, he's going to fight your battles. He's going to do the deportations, and he's he's going to do the you know all the things, whatever the things are. Okay, he's going to do all the things, and he's going to be a strong man, and he's going to fix it. I don't think he can, based on how our system of government works. He's not allowed to be the strong man, et cetera, et cetera. But we want someone who's going to fight our battles, right? We want to live under a good king because it's the best system of government there is. Um, we want this person to be kind of the the, the father of a, the nation, you know? Uh, in ancient Rome, again, sorry, uh, in the, the field... Um, the Roman consuls had command of life or death over their troops. Like, you know, they could have you executed for your crimes or whatever, or desertion or, you know, whatever it was. Uh, at home, the father had absolute authority, life or death, over his family. Okay. You can like it or hate it. I'm just, I'm just telling you how it was. Um, and again, they had, they very much were aware and embraced this concept of like father of the family, father of the nation, father of the of the people, right? Father of the army. Like that was, that was the whole idea. Um, and that there was one man who was answerable and in charge and accountable and could fix it, right? Could, could get out there and fix it. And in his, in his domain, he had the power to do what he needed to do, right? You know, in a Republic, nobody has the power or at least they shouldn't. And uh, even if they do have it, they blame everybody else because then they, they say they don't have it, right? So it's an excuse. Well, you know, like Biden's been saying for years, right? I'd love to do something about the border, but no one will, I can't do that. No one will give me the power and authority to do it, right? I need Congress to do something. And under a monarchy with a strong man, there's no excuses. Well, you didn't do it. You're the king. So uh, guillotines, right? Like that. That's that's the solution. It's one of the really down big downsides of the of the monarchy, right? But I don't think we're going to be able to solve this problem of human sin, human erring, whatever you want to call it. I'm going to stick with sin. That's what the Bible calls it. But we can't solve that. And look, I, th I think, I'll just say now, I think there's a reason we want the king, 
right? There's a reason we want the king because we are made to worship a king, right? Jesus, namely. Um, like when God made people, he designed them to know him and worship him forever. And so part of that design of how the human hearts were made is that they long for a good ruler. Why? Because God is our good ruler and we should long for him. And so we try to find it in these other places with our Trumps and our Richard the Lion hearts and, and our Joseph Stalins, right? And our Mao's, right? Like those two last two, obviously horribly evil. Um, but we tried it. We tried to find it there, right? Because that's just how we were made. And you cannot outrun, contrary to popular belief, your biology or your how you were made and formed. You just, you can't, you cannot outrun that. Right? You need to breathe air and drink water or you will die. You need to worship something or you will die. It's just, you're going to do it. You're going to worship something. The question is, what is it, right? Um, so I think that because we have this built-in default setting that you can't factory re the factory reset is is to want the strong man. So there's no such thing as doing a factory reset. There's no such thing as reprogramming. It is hardwired into the human heart that we're going to long for the strong man. I just I just inescapable. Show me an example in history where people have successfully escaped that. Oh well, you know I mean we escaped it in America, and I would say yeah really look at current politics right. They wanted to make George Washington king even in the beginning. That, that it was this close to George Washington just being the king, right? Even then they longed for it. Rome had a cutout to have a dictator come in and be the strong man, right? You could say, oh, well, you know, it worked out in like Athens. And I would tell you, no, no, it didn't. Uh, several strong men arose. Um, and usually it was someone who could, uh, who's very eloquent, who would then sway the people and they would be the, the strong man, right? Democracies, pure democracies are tyranny. Uh, obviously, that should be obvious. If not, read a history book. That's why the Founding Fathers very specifically set up America to not be a democracy. People are like, oh, we got to save democracy and protect democracy. Why? We're not a democracy. Democracy is horrible. Again, history issues, but I digress. So, as we think about it and think about the strong man, I guess there are a couple things I want you to keep in mind. One, again, like I said, it's a default setting. If we could find a good strong man, that would probably be good, you know? And I think we're probably heading towards a time in history when there will be a strong man, whether you want one or not. Uh, just when one system fails, like like a di late stage dying republic, another system is going to rise up in its place. And it's probably not going to be the same system that just failed. Just again, speaking from history, speaking from understanding how people work and the human condition, if something didn't work, unless you're a communist, you're not going to say, oh, hey, let's spin that up again right? Well, that wasn't real communism. We just need to do it again, right? Um, but unless you're a, a commie, you're, you're not going to want to spin that up again. You're going to say, well, we tried the Republic thing. That didn't work out so hot. So maybe we should give feudalism a try, or maybe we'll kind of work out some half feudal governorship, electoral county strongman thing. I don't know. I'm just spitballing here. Point is, is we're probably not going to, going to, go back to the Republic anytime soon after it crumples here in the next, I don't know, five days, 10 years, whatever. Um, and it probably will be factory default setting, some kind of strong man oriented thing where power is actually more concentrated rather than more diffused. Why? Because we're in crisis. And anytime there's a crisis, again, we long for the strong man. You look at World War II, and England, and what did they do? They longed for the strong man. So what did they do? They went and got Churchill. And they put Churchill in charge. Big gruff. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna show the we're gonna fight them on the beaches, and we're you know, big gruff man. We will not bow to Hitler, and you know, very very tough gruff strong man, right? That's what we do. That's what we do. So, as you think about the strong man. I think there are two things. One, I don't think the strong man is inherently evil. I think that the strong man becomes a problem because absolute power corrupts absolutely, right? Where we give the strong man too much power, we lay a burden on them that they cannot bear. 
right? They're not able to bear it. And so as a result, they get corrupted and the power goes in their head and they like having to tell people what to do and they like everything served to them and, and it corrupts. Historically speaking, it's what it does, you know? So I think we should be suspicious of the strongman thing, not because it's bad, but because it doesn't work, because it can't fix the human condition, because it cannot outrun what what people are. One. Two, I think that understanding there are times when strongmen arise, and again, they're not inherently the problem, might help you feel a little bit more opened up to it. I think in America, we have this, just like the Romans, we have this natural aversion to dictatorship or, or tyranny or kingship, right? It's like, ugh, ugh. we told the king to, you know, go to hell in 1776 and I haven't heard from him since. And that's the way it is because we're Americans and we do what we want. And we have this kind of libertarian Viking kind of thing going on, which is cool. I like that. I'm an American, right? But understand that there are times when you might need the strong man, right? When there's a lot of big problems, giving someone power who can actually fix it, who will fix it, sometimes is effective. Again, historically speaking, it works, okay? How does that exactly work in our system? What does that exactly mean? I don't know. Uh, but I do think we should be highly suspicious of it and we should understand that there are times when it works and it's a huge gray area in there and you got to figure it out. But... As you think about the strong man, and, and and I think I hope you see this. I hope that after listening to this, you're gonna you're gonna see the the strong man uh, problem, uh, worship, desire more often in people. And you watch these Trump rallies, and you're like, why do people behave that way? And you'll say, oh, because they want the strong man. Because they think Trump is the strong man. He's gonna fix all the problems. I understand. Same thing with Obama, by the way. Right? Obama had massive excitement about Obama. Why? He was a strong man. He was gonna fix it. Right? So same same concept. So, be suspicious of the strong man. Realize there's probably one or multiple strong men coming in your lifetime here. If you get to live the next 10, 20, 30 years, whatever. Um, and you're going to have to figure out how to navigate that as an everyday person. Uh, because as the gears of history turn... Uh, we're all just caught in them at some point or another. And uh, hopefully, we're not going to get ground to dust between those gears, but hopefully we'll be able to understand the times we live in, understand what's important and relevant, and, and be planning for what comes after. After the fall, after the strong men, what's the world that we want to live in? And how can, what can we do now to help shape that world. I hope that gives you something to think about. Do brave deeds and endure.